Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at another video from Answers in Genesis Canada, but while it is still the man with the fabulously eclectic wardrobe Calvin Smith, it's from one other series I haven't touched on yet, the Genesis account of Noah's Ark. I skipped right to the last video in the series because I feel that it's the most interesting of the four. I may swing back around to cover one or two of the other ones later, but this is the one that gets right into the important detail of whether or not there is actually evidence for Noah's Flood. So let's go! There's no physical evidence for a worldwide flood. This is a commonly heard objection to belief in the account of the Great Deluge described in Genesis 6-9. It's not just that there is no evidence for the Flood, it's also that there is a plethora of evidence against the Flood. I don't even have to go to secular research journals for some of it. Dr. John Baumgartner, a creationist geophysicist, published a paper in Creation Research Society Quarterly that concluded that the amount of energy involved in the creationist model of the worldwide flood would have rendered the entire Earth a molten ball that would take tens of millions of years to cool, and so concludes that, rather than admit that the creation model is fundamentally flawed, creationists should just get comfortable with the idea of invoking God's miraculous powers as the explanation for how it happened. It's literally concluding that since I can't be wrong, it must have been magic. Call me crazy, but I don't think that would be the conclusion if the evidence actually pointed to a flood. And many skeptics believe this claim invalidates the Bible and Christianity. There are certainly branches of Christianity that manage to exist without insisting on a literal interpretation of Genesis, but yeah, I would tend to agree that from a theological perspective, if Genesis isn't true the way that AIG wants it to be true, then original sin doesn't make sense, and so atonement for original sin becomes a weird phenomenon to say the least. But Christians are a group of people who manage to make one plus one equal one, so it's not surprising that they can make the whole Jesus thing work without a literal original sin. Though I do use the term work very loosely here. And they have a point. After all, if someone can't trust the beginning of the Bible, why should they believe the rest of it? And given that no matter where you look in the Bible you can find things that are demonstrably wrong, you're right, you can't trust it. It's wrong about history, human nature, science, geography, astronomy, you name it, the Bible's wrong about it. Hell, the Bible is even racist specifically against people from the island of Crete. Titus chapter 1 points out that Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. But context is key here. This is actually the author of Titus misquoting the Epimenides Paradox. The Epimenides Paradox, for those of you unfamiliar, was meant to point out the flaw of self-reference in logic. Epimenides, a Cretan, says that all Cretans are liars. Which, if true, means that it cannot be true, because Epimenides is a Cretan, and therefore a liar. But the author of Titus just completely missed the point and took it at face value as a true statement. So this passage of the Bible is either demonstrably wrong because not everybody from Crete fits that description, or it's demonstrably wrong in that it missed the entire point of the Epimendes paradox. But no matter how you interpret it, it is demonstrably wrong. However, the scriptures themselves not only predict this denial happening, but also contend with this declaration. The guys writing the founding documents of a new religion predicted that there would be people who didn't believe in the new religion? How amazing! Stating, For this they willingly forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. The wording there sounds kind of flat earthy. But I know that AIG likes to use the English Standard Version in most cases, so whenever they switch to another translation, that puts up some red flags for me. So let's look at these verses in English Standard Version. Well, I think I got it. The ESV makes it clear that the earth was made out of water, rather than standing out of water. Which, yeah, I get it, the earth is demonstrably not made entirely out of water. But they have no qualms with the verses talking about how humans are made out of dirt, so I wonder why Miraculous Transfiguration is okay for humans, but not for the Earth. But back to the lack of evidence claim. Everyone accepts that fossil-laden rock layers cover the continents, and most of these were laid down by water. Yes, 
Because of how the fossilization process works, and because of how deposition works, the depositional layers that are most likely to contain fossils also tend to be the ones that were laid down by water. Though certainly fossils from dry environments are not unheard of, the water ones are more common. And this is actually evidence against the flood. Some of the rock layers are actually made up of organic material themselves. Organic limestone, for instance, is made out of the calcium from skeletons of dead marine creatures. There is so much organic limestone on the earth that it is physically impossible for all the creatures whose skeletons make up the limestone to have existed simultaneously, and so they could not have all died in one single flood event. You can even break this up into the different types of organic limestone. Just look at the massive chalk beds that can be found all over the planet. They are made of the skeletons of tiny organisms known as coccolithophores. If enough coccolithophores to form the chalk beds of the earth all existed at the same time, there wouldn't be enough sunlight to sustain them. And that's just them, that's not even taking into account the other photosynthetic organisms that would have had to exist at the same time. On top of all that, if all the rock layers formed in the same event, then we'd expect the chalk layers, and the other similar fine-grained sediment layers, to be on the top. Chalk needs calm water in order to form. The particles are so fine that they are easily swept up into a current. Considering how tumultuous the flood would have been, all the fine-grained calm water needing sediments should be the last ones to settle. But they aren't. They're buried underneath other types of layers. Some creationists like to tell you that you can see the layers for yourself with that experiment where you put a bunch of different types of sediment in a bottle of water and then shake it up, ignoring for the moment that the different types of sediment always end up mixing with each other at least a little, it will always result in the coarser grain sediment being on the bottom with the fine grain sediment on top. And that's just not what we see in the rock layers of the Earth. Could that be evidence for a global flood? Not unless you are only taking a superficial look at it. Look, all this stuff was laid down by water, therefore it was all one flood event. But in reality, when you look at the details, it is, again, excellent evidence against the flood. Look, there's layers laid down by water on either side of a layer that formed in a dry, arid environment. Look, there's rivers, volcanic ash, mudslides, transition zones, alluvial fans, and more that all require specific conditions that are not met by a flood in order to form. So yeah, superficially you can say that water played a part in probably the majority of the sedimentary rock layers formations, but the devil's in the details, and the details don't support a flood. Perhaps the problem is not lack of evidence. The evidence is right there in front of us. The problem is that many scientists don't see it because they've accepted a different history of the Earth. Yeah, sure. It's all about interpretation, and the people that need to ignore and misrepresent vast swaths of various scientific fields of study in order to make their worldview look kinda sorta tenable are obviously the ones with the correct interpretation. They say the fossils are the record of death over hundreds of millions of years, even though that popular view is rife with problems. It's only rife with problems if you… you know what, I can't actually think of anything that would make that view rife with problems. It actually solves a great many problems, such as the one I brought up where all the animals represented in the fossil record could not possibly have existed simultaneously. Perhaps it's simply a matter of swapping worldviews, like taking off a pair of glasses and putting on a different pair that lets you see through a different lens. I think we saw from the creationist paper earlier that it's not quite as simple as just swapping worldviews, because even in the creationist worldview, the flood is impossible. So given that both sides agree that Noah's flood is physically impossible, I opt to go with the people that don't then appeal to magic to try and make their worldview make sense in spite of the evidence. The physical features of the Earth's terrain clearly indicate a catastrophic past. Yeah, absolutely, they do. Like, for instance, the massive crater in Central America that indicates an asteroid impact some 65 million years ago, which also deposited a layer of iridium across the entire globe. From canyons and craters to coal beds and caverns. Some layers of strata extend across continents, revealing the effects of a huge catastrophe. Not all sedimentary rock is the result of a huge catastrophe. I'd actually wager that most of them are not. 
They are, for the most part, the result of slow and steady deposition of sediments, with the various environments where the deposition is happening shaping the characteristics of the rocks. A deltaic deposit, for instance, is the deposition that happens at a river delta. There are river deltas that exist today that are depositing sediment that might one day be sedimentary rock, and yet they are not catastrophic events, it's just a river doing what rivers do. There are coccolithophores alive today that are still living their lives and eventually dying and sinking to the seafloor in an accumulation that might lead to future chalk beds if the right conditions are met for long enough. This is not a catastrophe. Although, thanks to the looming catastrophe that is climate change, the coccolithophores of today have calcium carbonate shells that are about 40% thicker than the coccolithophores that existed before the Industrial Revolution, probably as an adaptation to the acidifying oceans. These layers of sand, soil, and material, mostly laid down by water, were once soft like mud. Yeah, maybe, but they weren't laid down at the same time, though, that's for sure. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a clear delineation between the layers, they would be mixed together in a kind of gradient. Remember our experiment of different types of sediment in a jar of water? If you look closely, the layer lines that you see after shaking the jar and letting it settle aren't quite as delineated as they appear from a distance. Some of the fine grain sediment gets mixed in with the coarser sediment, creating more of a gradient than actual isolated layers. This is not what we see in geology. We see clear delineation between the layers, with some rare exceptions. In other words, each layer had to fully lithify, that is, turn into solid rock, before the next layer was deposited, which couldn't possibly have happened for as many layers as we have in as short a period of time as was required for Noah's Flood to be the explanation for the rock layers. And encased in these sedimentary layers are billions of dead things, fossils of plants and animals, buried very quickly. Most of them, yeah. The speed of burial varies from fossil to fossil depending on what environment it was in when it died, and also depending on what type of fossil it is. A larger animal with a robust skeleton, for instance, could be exposed for a longer period of time before being buried, and its skeleton could still be preserved, while a small, soft-bodied, potentially boneless animal would need to pretty much be buried right away in order to be preserved. But yeah, relatively rapid burial is an important step in the fossilization process. If the Genesis Flood were merely a myth, then we could assume and dismiss the coming judgment as mythological as well. It is, and I do. But many people, of course, want what they feel is rock-solid evidence for their beliefs. Ah, I see what you did there. So let's look at some. Fossils, for example. Consider the fact that it takes special conditions to make a fossil, and the world is covered with billions of them in mass graves. Yes. Consider that fact, which then leads you to the realization that the vast, vast majority of organisms to have ever lived would not have been fossilized as they wouldn't have met these very specific conditions, and then realize that the flood model wants all of the fossilized organisms to have existed simultaneously, and with how many fossils there are, all the fossilized organisms couldn't possibly have coexisted. Like, it's not physically possible. Now consider the incredibly low percentage of organisms that actually get fossilized, and you're left with a completely ludicrous number of organisms having to live on the Earth simultaneously in order to result in the fossilizations that we see in the rocks today. Once more, adding in the actual scientific model, that's the one with billions of years, it now makes sense why we could have so many fossils and yet still complain that the fossil record is so spotty. Because most organisms were never fossilized, but so many organisms have existed at this point that we end up with lots of fossils anyway. In contrast to the slow, standard evolutionary story of deposition of sediments making fossils slowly over hundreds of years, in reality, creatures must be buried rapidly before they rot or get eaten by scavengers. Name one geologist, paleontologist, or any other relevant scientist from the evolutionary side of things who won't agree with you that rapid burial is a normal part of the fossilization process. Now, the process of permineralization itself can be relatively fast, happening in a few decades on some rare occasions, or it can take a few million years, and depending on conditions, anywhere in between. And here it would be helpful to define a few terms. Technically speaking, to be a fossil, it just has to be an artifact that is a result of an organism's activity if that is at least 10,000 years old. These can be footprints, nests, imprints, and yes, even bones. 
when most people think of fossils, they generally think of permineralized bones, that is, bones where the original material of the bone has been replaced with minerals over time. What Calvin appears to be counting on here is the conflation of the words fossil and permineralized, as we actually do have incompletely permineralized fossils that are millions of years old, that is, animal bones that are at least still partially made of the original bone material. It's still a fossil, despite not having completed the process that we think of as the fossilization process, so it's not that fossils take millions of years to form, it's that the permineralization process, which is not the only fossilization process, can take millions of years to complete. And in fact, vast numbers of animals were buried and fossilized so quickly that some couldn't even finish swallowing their meal or giving birth. This is just such a ridiculously inane point to make. Are you suggesting that the permineralization process happened faster than it would take to swallow or give birth? Because that is just laughable. Now, this is where you're trying to lead to with your conflation of permineralization and fossilization. The whole process must take millions of years, so if you see an animal in a situation like this where it has a partially eaten meal in its mouth, the process can't have taken millions of years, right? Well, let me ask you. If you die suddenly, while well, you still have food in your mouth, do you finish swallowing? No, you don't. Because you're dead. Doesn't much matter what the cause of death is, once you're dead, you don't swallow. So let's say, hypothetically, you die in a mudslide that happens suddenly and buries you, killing you instantly while you have food in your mouth. Why do you think we would expect to find your fossilized remains not with food in its mouth under the evolutionary model? The fact that dead things don't continue swallowing does not do anything to demonstrate that the Earth is young. And we also have multiple examples of soft-bodied creatures like squid, octopus, and even jellyfish, which turn to goo in a matter of days once they die. Like I said, rapid burial is an important part of the fossilization process. Are you really incapable of figuring out any of a number of non-global flood events that might bury a jellyfish or a squid? Like, say, a mudslide? A natural dam breach bringing a large inflow of sediment down a river into the sea? A falling of volcanic ash on beach jellyfish? And any of a number of other scenarios. Being perfectly preserved, certainly not the result of some slow geological process. How so? Just because the burial is rapid doesn't mean the permineralization is also rapid. But rather evidence of rapid burial and fossilization indeed. Now, you've given evidence for rapid burial, but not rapid permineralization. Nobody contests the rapid burial. Another obvious evidence that makes sense in a global flood is fossils of tree trunks, some of them 30 feet tall, standing upright or upside down through one or more layers. You know, I'd really like to know if there are any non-creationist sources for the upside down trees, so if you know of any, please comment down below and let me know. Of course, the upright trees are easy enough to understand, their explanation has been known since the 1860s. Basically, we know trees can stand for long periods of time, sometimes centuries after they die. If they happen to be in an area of low oxygen, like, say, a bog, fast-forming organic layers could easily build up around the tree over time, and there is evidence for this. The layers surrounding these upright fossil trees contain other plants complete with root systems in multiple layers, which means that there had to be at least enough time for some of the plants to grow in between the different layers' depositions. It's not surprising that the only fossils ever to be found protruding through multiple layers are those of organisms that are known to be able to remain standing upright for long periods of time after their death. But back to the upside down ones, how could that happen? The short answer is, I'm not sure. The longer answer is, I'm not sure, and I doubt the truth of the claim that such trees have been found. Certainly it's easy to find creationists making that claim, but I have yet to find anyone citing a source for that claim that would have any sort of relevant credentials to have analyzed and come to the conclusion about them without just being a case of them seeing what they wanted to see. People like Ian Juby, who as far as I can tell has no credentials of his own, or Sylvia Baker, who is a radiation biologist whose PhD is in education, or Harold Coffin, who specialized in invertebrate zoology. No paleontologists, no geologists, no dendrologists, nobody who would be qualified to identify the remains of a fossilized root system. 
But let's hypothetically say that we have found an upside down fossil tree going through many layers. The idea there is that a floating log lodged itself in the mud during the flood, right? Assuming that would be normal behavior for a log during a flood, why does this flood have to be global in order for that to have happened? Could a local flood not also lodge a tree in some mud in that manner? I just don't see how that would even count as evidence for the flood. This doesn't make sense with the slow accumulation of layers over millions of years. No, it doesn't, but as my geology textbook here is happy to tell you in the caption for literally the first picture in the book, figure 1.1, some sedimentary accumulation can happen very rapidly, such as the types of sediment found around these upright fossil trees. Creationists like to make it sound like geologists are hiding the fact that sedimentary accumulation can be fast, but this is literally on page 5 of a standard geology textbook. The information could only be easier to find if it were in the title of the book. But instead, it's a sign that these polystrate fossils were buried rapidly. Rapidly for geology, yes, possibly less than 300 years, but slowly enough that new plant life had a chance to grow in each of the different layers that buried the trees. So way too slow for Noah's flood. Another example which tourists can visit around the world is rock layers that were deposited around the globe at the same time. Interesting that you bring that up, because usually creationists like to attack the idea of the geologic column, which isn't actually something that you'll find in typical geology literature. They combine the geologic time scale, which is basically the list of the different geologic time periods, like Jurassic, Cretaceous, Carboniferous, Silurian, etc., and the concept of the stratigraphic column, which is the specific stratigraphic progression of any specific location. They then smash these two concepts together and pretend that it's an idea from mainstream geology, and then laugh at the fact that such a column doesn't exist in the real world because the rock layers just simply aren't usually global layers. But now here we are with the creationists talking about the fact that global layers do exist as if that were evidence for the flood, which I guess it could be. Ironically, if the geologic column that creationists like to pretend is a concept from mainstream geology actually existed, that would be better evidence for the geologic record being the result of a global event than for the geologic concepts as we understand them today. Because if the rock layers all formed in one single global event, then we would expect the vast majority of rock layers to be global layers. And so the stratigraphy of every location should be more or less identical. But as creationists are usually fond of pointing out, that's not how it worked out. Turns out each location has its own unique stratigraphy that reflects that area's own unique geologic history, with some few global or nearly global layers being the exception rather than the rule. This is consistent with the Genesis account of a worldwide versus a regional catastrophe. Exactly! I'm so glad you agree. If the rock layers were all caused by one single global event, the rock layers should pretty much all be global, or at least most of them should be global, with some few rock layers being the exception rather than the rule. But unfortunately for you, as I pointed out, the global layers are the exception, not the rule. For example, the Tapete Sandstone, which sits on the basement rocks of Grand Canyon in Arizona, also appears far away in Wisconsin and across the ocean in Israel and Libya under different names. Okay, firstly, the Tapete Sandstone is part of the Tonto Group, which, taken together, represents a vast, shallow, fairly calm sea slowly encroaching on the continent over millions of years. So the Tapete Sandstone doesn't help your case. Secondly, the similarity of the geography in Israel is simply in that the layer that corresponds to the same time period is also sandstone but it's an entirely different kind of sandstone, with the tapetes being made of mostly schist and granite pebbles, and the Amudi Shalomo formation of Israel being made of subarcos, a sandstone in which 5-25% to of the sand grains are feldspar. So essentially, creationists like to claim this as being one big continuous layer because they're both superficially the same kind of stone, sandstone. But once again, when you look at the actual details, it doesn't support the creationist claims. How could a local flood deposit the same rock layer across multiple continents? I mean, you could just start with the fact that the Tapete Sandstone was not the result of a flood deposit, it was beach and sandbar deposits. So minus one point for not even knowing what depositional environment you're talking about right off the bat. 
But of course, being a creationist, you're probably not even allowed to acknowledge that the different depositional environments even exist. It's all water, so it was all flood, so it was all THE flood, right? Wrong. It was a beach. The Grand Canyon also contains multiple flat layers that are sitting on top of one another, without any evidence of erosion in between. Would the fact that it's flat not itself be evidence of erosion? That's kind of what erosion does, isn't it? It flattens and smooths things out. Also, I'm pretty sure you're talking about the unconformities here, which are essentially missing time periods from the rock layers. They happen because deposition is not universal. Sometimes some environments won't accumulate sediment. If that environment persists for long enough, it will leave a gap in the geologic record. Other times, geologic activities such as uplift can cause existing layers to become exposed to the elements, resulting in their erosion. Evolutionary inclined scientists believe these were deposited millions of years apart, and in fact, other deposits were laid in the interim in other places. Yeah, so it was either a period of non-deposition or the deposits that were there eroded before the next deposit started accumulating. For example, the Coconino sandstone sits directly on top of the Hermit formation, but there's no indication of any layer deposited between these two layers seen elsewhere. Yeah, there is an unconformity there. Such things are to be expected when the whole world doesn't share the same depositional environment. Supposedly, five to ten million years passed before the Coconino sandstone was deposited on top of the Hermit Formation without evidence of any erosion. The Coconino looks like it was in fact deposited immediately on top of the Hermit. I mean, the Coconino sandstone is about 275 million years old and the Hermit Shale is about 280 million years old. Five million years is a long time to us, but geologically speaking that is pretty much instantly. Wouldn't you call this evidence for a global flood? No. I'd call it evidence for local conditions being different all over the Earth, which is actually evidence against a global flood. Or how about this one? You can go to many places on the planet and see row upon row of consecutively deposited rock layers that were soft when deposited and then bent, sometimes drastically. Rocks don't normally bend, they break because they're hard and brittle. Normally, yes, but not when you heat them enough. When you heat them, they get softer. Kind of like putting crayons in the oven. If you try to bend a crayon, it'll snap in two because it's hard and brittle. But put it in the oven for a couple minutes, pull it out, and try to bend it now, and you can bend it much farther without it breaking. These rocks would have been subducted at some point and had geologic stress applied while being heated, making them much more pliable. But if similar stresses were placed on them before they were lithified, then the different layers would be mixed in together. They wouldn't be neatly separated like they are. So once again, the accepted geologic science wins against the creationist speculations based on a superficial glance at the data. But in many places we find whole sequences of strata that were bent without fracturing, indicating that all of the rock layers were rapidly deposited and folded while they were still wet and pliable before final hardening. Oh, there's a dick joke in there somewhere. Something, something soft, pliable, got hard over time. Yeah, fill in the blanks yourself. The Tapit sandstone in Grand Canyon is folded at a right angle without evidence of breaking. Except, of course, for the obvious breaks that are clearly visible in the picture that you're showing. Yet this folding could have only have occurred after the rest of the layers had been deposited. And somehow, while still soft mud, they managed to bend at a 90 degree angle while fracturing in several places, but without mingling any of their material together. Neat trick. Supposedly over 480 million years, while the Tapit sandstone remained wet and pliable. Nope. Nobody said that the Tapit sandstone remained wet and pliable for that amount of time. That's just another creationist straw man. And there's so much more. We find fossils of sea creatures in rock layers that cover all of the continents. Water makes up the majority of the surface of the Earth, and at one point or another, pretty much every area that is dry land now was submerged in water, but definitely not all simultaneously just 4,000 years ago. For example, most of the rock layers in the walls of the Grand Canyon, more than a mile above sea level, contain marine fossils. Those walls were not always above sea level. In fact, several of the Grand Canyon rock groups paint a very clear picture of shallow seas slowly encroaching across the continent, and then receding. Multiple times. It stands to reason that some sea creatures would have lived in those seas. <laughs> 
Fossilized shellfish are even found in the Himalayas. Because the Himalayas are made out of material that used to be on the seafloor. As the Indian tectonic plate smashes into the Eurasian tectonic plate, the seafloor gets scraped off onto the continent, much like rubbing two dirty dishes together. The uneaten food from the bottom plate builds up into a mountainous pile on the top plate, getting larger as more of the bottom plate is scraped off onto it. The Himalayas are the uneaten food in this analogy, and having once been on the seafloor, they are now on the mountaintops. And as such, we would expect to find marine fossils there. And once again, this doesn't actually work with a global flood. The physics of the flood are such that sediment would get washed off of the tops of the higher places and carried down and deposited into the lower places. So if there were a global flood, we would not expect to see sea creatures on the mountaintops. We'd expect to see sediment from the mountains accumulated in the valleys and canyons. We find extensive fossil graveyards and exquisitely preserved fossils. For example, Billions of nautiloid fossils are found in a layer within the Redwall limestone of Grand Canyon. This layer was deposited catastrophically by a massive flow of sediment. No, definitely not. The lithologic evidence suggests that the Redwall limestone was deposited by a sea that encroached on the continent and then receded three separate times. That is not one catastrophic flood. Mostly limestone. The chalk and coal beds of Europe and the United States, and the fish, ichthyosaurs, insects, and other fossils all around the world testify of catastrophic destruction and burial. Maybe, but definitely not all in the same event. As discussed, that is physically impossible for a number of different reasons. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from a bunch of you. On my video responding to Alan Parr explaining why millennials are leaving the church, I made an offhanded comment that most medicinal claims surrounding marijuana are BS. And I got a bunch of comments for how, yeah, sure, there are some claims that are BS, but it's actually really great for X, with X being a different thing depending on who was speaking. Many were quite insistent that I look into it more, seeming to assume that because I came to a conclusion that they disagree with, I must not have looked into the data. Well, a 2017 review found that there is not enough evidence from well-designed clinical trials to support the use of cannabis for headache, but there are sufficient anecdotal and preliminary results, as well as plausible neurological mechanisms to warrant properly designed clinical trials. A 2018 review of cannabis-based medicines for chronic neuropathic pain concluded that the potential benefits of cannabis-based medicine in chronic neuropathic pain might be outweighed by their potential harms. A 2015 review of using cannabis to treat non-cancer pain concluded that generalizing the use of medical marijuana to all chronic non-cancer pain conditions does not appear to be supported by existing evidence. And there's more. What this all comes down to is that the evidence at this stage is preliminary at best, and requires better designed studies in order to come to any conclusive results. The best evidence for medicinal marijuana at this point is an indication that more evidence is needed before a firm conclusion can be drawn. And while the negative health impacts of marijuana are likely much less severe than, say, alcohol, they do exist and have not been extensively studied either. So it is difficult to say at this point if the medical benefits outweigh the potential negative effects. If you or someone you know has been using it and it has worked for you or for them, then good. But just keep in mind that this is, by its very nature, an anecdotal account, meaning that the evidence is anecdotal and at best indicates that further study is needed. And lest I come off as anti-marijuana, I'm not. I think it's fine. If you want to use it recreationally, I don't judge you. I don't judge people who use it. In fact, the only thing that stopped me from using it recreationally is just that I don't like the smell of the smoke. But don't fall for the hype train that's claiming that it can cure a whole bunch of stuff for which there is, at best, preliminary indication that there might be an effect whose size is thus far undetermined. Thanks for watching, thanks to this week's PayPal hero Dallas, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, Clen Cheesewood, Lynn Dobbs, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the heat that makes the rock that is my channel soft and pliable. If you'd like to get me all bent out of shape, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form or listen to my podcast with my daughter, the links for those are also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!